Now, let's go into our second module and recall that our first module was on the science of global warming and climate change. Now that you understand that there is a problem with the science, the United Nations decided that no, it is not one country's problem. The whole world must come together to try and address this issue. And therefore the module two is on the United Nations process to address climate change. And this is done again, re realizing that there is the earth systems and there are human systems. And both of these need to be brought together under the purview of the United Nations because it's a big, big problem. Like you said, what happens in a neighboring country will affect you in another country because the atmosphere has no physical boundaries. Therefore, from the international policy perspective, we differentiate between the natural, which are in the white, the volcanoes and natural emission, the solar and solar uh, orbital variability, because we can't do much about these except just to watch. You can't, you can't go and sit on top of the volcano to make it stop uh, um, blasting or the solar, you can't go to the sun and hold it. But what we can do is talk about the anthropogenic emissions. So the policy perspective, therefore, only tries to address the, the human-made emissions. The emissions of greenhouse gases that are a result of human activity. The idea is that these are the emissions that we can reduce so that we have an impact on the composition of the atmosphere, so that we impact on the radiative forcing, and hopefully, hopefully that will change the temperature of the earth, of the atmosphere, and the impacts will be discernible, and we can start looking at that and this. And at each one of these, there will be actions that we can take. Today, we're not going to talk about the actions that we can take, but rather to try and understand that there is this global approach, which is called the treaty, the United Nations Treaty, which is called the UNFCCCC. So let us remember that historically, for the period between 1900 to uh, 1999, 30% 30 of the global, the issue of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere is, um, we can blame it on the United States, 27, 28% on Europe, 13% on the former Soviet Union. The other countries, you know, the China, the India, the Middle East, the Africa, and Central, all account for about 20% or, or, or so. So the people who have done the most emissions into the atmosphere are those countries in red. They, are, they have pumped in a lot of atmosphere. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They did this because they were developing. And we have like, um, uh, in the first module, given an example of a relationship between the emissions of CO2, fossil, fossil fuel uh, use, etc., and the emissions into the CO, of CO2 into the atmosphere. So if you look at just to cite an example, the, all the countries in red have been driving cars for a long, much longer time than we have been in Africa. All of those cars, or countries in there have lights, they have energy, the cities are bright and beautiful. 
the amount Africa is sometimes called the dark continent, not because we're dark literacy, it is dark, literally dark because the energy per capita is low. So these are the countries that have emitted most of the anthropogenic CO2. But of course today, China is a major emitter. So realizing this problem, in 1979, the first World Climate Co uh, Conference was held and the United Nations General Assembly realized that there was a problem and agreed that yes, indeed, there is an impact of accelerated change in the climate system. And therefore, in 1990, an intergovernmental negotiating committee to go and draft the UNFCCC, the text of the United Nations Framework Convention, was established. The drafting was negotiated and adopted in 1992. Now, the treaty has no mandatory limits on the greenhouse gas emissions for countries. What the treaty says, and you please go and read it. It is one of those reference materials that I've given to you. Please go and read it. The treaty only says, yes, there is a problem. And that this problem is global in nature, and that we're going to need to address it together, and et cetera. But it does not set any limit on the greenhouse gases for individual countries. For example, the main objective of the UNFCCCC is to stabilize the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. So we must go back um, uh, to that understanding of what do we mean by stabilization of greenhouse gas emissions? Do we mean uh, decrease? No. Do we mean increase? No. It is stabilized. But it goes further to say that the, that stabilization level should not prevent interference with the climate system. Oh, so therefore, we are getting the, um, the, the, the demand for the science to say, what is the dangerous level? So therefore, we have the IPCC. The IPCC main mandate, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change mandate, is to try and define what is the dangerous level for anthropogenic interference with the climate system. But what the UNFCCC does, what the convention does, it says we must do it fast enough so that we allow ecosystems to adapt naturally. Oh, so it says this thing is very urgent and we must do it before ecosystems collapse and to ensure that food production is not threatened and to enable sustainable economic development. So don't, don't compromise your development for, which is a very controversial issue, but I'll leave it to you to use it every time you want to argue your case and the negotiations under climate change, because you must ensure that you have sustainable economic development and that your food production is not present. You, you, you don't want to, to, to um, achieve the goal of the ENFC at the same time you are dying of hunger. But then the convention also comes up with principles. And one of the principles is a very interesting one. And it says, the principle of equity, but common of, of equity and common but differentiated responsibility with respect to capabilities. So it says, whether, while we're common on this problem of climate change, because we're all in it together, we're on one earth, but the responsibility 
on the problem are differentiated. There are those who have caused more, and therefore there are also those with less capacity to cope with climate change, which is very interesting and very so. This I'm, I'm unpacking this objective, Article Two of the Convention, because it is so loaded. It is the basis for your negotiations under climate change. But the IPCC was established in 1988. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's it, one that came up with the science to say, hey, there's a problem here. And then 1990, the United Nations General Assembly agreed, no, let's uh, have it with the NFCCCC. And in 1994, the uh, Climate Change Convention was born. Now, in 1990, after we signed the convention, we started realizing, oh, there's no mandatory limit. So we came up with the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol says, so and so must reduce by so much by, by this date. So the Kyoto Protocol is the one that comes up with the mandatory emissions reduction limits. And it's in fact assigns limit reduction by country, not by region. And we also go to negotiate what are called the Marrakesh Accords, where the um, operational rules for emission, uh, em, uh, emissions trading, uh, uh, clean development mechanisms and joint implications joint implementation uh, uh, mechanisms were, were born. Now, these are very much related to what we're going to talk to under Article 6, which is um, uh, the, the uh, uh, carbon markets and carbon trading systems. But these were under the Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto Protocol entered into force um, much, much later in um, 2005. But let me rush way down to where we are today. That um, in 2015, we agreed on a Paris Agreement. Why did we need a Paris Agreement? Because the Kyoto Protocol was saying by 20, um, that we should start negotiating. The Kyoto Protocol had a time limit. So we had come to the end of the Kyoto Protocol. So we started needing to agree on what was going to happen after the Kyoto Protocol. Because the Kyoto Protocol was saying, by 2015, these countries must have reduced by so much, by 2020, by so much, et cetera, et cetera. So that was defined as what was called the first commitment period. So the second commitment period was then reviewed, and we found we haven't done too much. So, so we came up with the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement says, no. Um, and a lot of countries put pressure on others to say, well, we need to be all in it. So, of course, Africa has, I mean, Africa is only about 4%. Whether you're in it or out of it, you're so insignificant, so small that uh, you're better in it than out of it. So, we came into the Paris Agreement. A lot of our countries signed the Paris Agreement. So that's where we are. In last year at, at COP26 in 2021, an Article 6 of the Paris Agreement rule book governing carbon markets was adopted. We're going into uh, uh, later this year uh, to uh, Egypt um, uh, to COP27. Oh. What is it all about? These negotiations are about the big guys with the small boys outside who are crying for climate justice. 